our context, the load our systems have to withstand is the type of attacker that we are repelling. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Industrial Security Podcast. My name is Nate Nelson. I'm here as usual with Andrew Ginter, the Vice President of Industrial Security at Waterfall Security Solutions. He's going to introduce the subject and the guest of today's show. Andrew, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you, Nate. Our guest today is Terry Inglesby. He is the president of Amanaza Technologies and the chief technical architect of the SecureTree threat modeling software. That's a bit of a mouthful, but we're going to be going through that. Our topic today is attack trees and the science of security. Hello, Terry, and thank you for joining us. Before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about Amanaza? Sure. Nice to be with you, Andrew. Um, I am Terry Inglesby. I'm president of Amanaza Technologies and uh, the chief technical architect of the Security Threat Modeling Software. I started Amanaza, gee, it's exactly, almost exactly 20 years ago, uh, last week, I think it was. And uh, we've been involved in advanced threat modeling uh, over this period of time. Um, Basically, that's who I am. I have a background in computer science and computer security, and I also have a background in physics, which is kind of what got me into attack tree analysis. Our topic is attack trees. Can you talk about what is an attack tree? And in you know, you, you've introduced attack trees as the science of security. In what sense are they scientific? You know, when I was really getting started in computer security or information security. Uh, 20, 25 years ago, um, I was quite disappointed by the lack of rigor or the lack of objectivity that was being used in, in coming up with secure solutions. At first, I kind of thought this was just me, that I probably just didn't have enough education, so I went to all the computer conferences and took all the courses. And uh, I, I quickly realized that most of the people teaching those courses weren't any better off than I was. My background being in physics, uh, I very much like to have things that are rigorous and objective rather than the kind of gut feeling shoot from the hip, which is more of a security practice than a security science. So one day I was at a conference and I heard a talk given by Bruce Schneier, the noted uh, cryptographer and security expert, and he talked about these things called attack trees. And I was intrigued. In fact, I was fascinated by them. Attack trees are basically a graphical tree diagram, much like a decision tree, but that uses and or logic to describe the combinations of low level activities of an adversary and how they combine together uh, to perform a successful attack. Now, I tell people that the great thing about attack trees is you can have a very, very compact attack tree that can actually capture and describe 10,000 or 100,000 different attacks. And at the same time, the worst thing about attack trees is a very compact structure can capture 100,000 different attacks. So it's both a pro and a con, but the nice thing about it is you can get a lot of information about how an attacker is going to deal with your system on the screen. And you can actually do a lot of analysis on this using mathematics. Basically, you can plot out paths through these trees that uh, can only be realized by the attacker uh, based on the amount of resource that they're able to supply to perform the exploits in the attack tree. You use the word compact, but then hundreds of thousands. You know, how can something that big be compact? What does compact mean? Well, compact in the sense uh, that the picture uh, is worth a thousand words. That, you know, if you show someone a picture of something, um, they immediately understand what you're talking about, whereas if you had to describe that in, in long words and sentences, it might take a long time and you might never get the entire message across. Uh, attack trees are much the same way. They're compact in the sense that you can put on the screen, uh, you know, on a single sheet of paper, if you will, a lot of information about the different phases of attacks, the different steps that an attacker will have to t uh, perform. In fact, in many cases, although there's almost infinite varieties on how in some, someone might attack a system, um, there are basic architectural methods that they're going to use. 
And that's something to, to bring out is that attack trees very much focus on the architecture of the system that you're attacking. For example, a number of years ago, um, I was uh, trying to do a physical attack model, something I don't really do much of. That's not my background, not my expertise. And I thought to myself, you know, I, I don't really understand how to do physical attacks, so I better phone a friend. So I called up these folks in uh, US Special Forces who are really good at physical attacks. And I said, guys, I gotta get into this building. How do I do it? And the guy said, he says, Terry, there's only three ways into a building. You come through the roof, you come through the walls, or you come underneath from the, through the floor. After that, it's all detail. And that really captured the essence of how attack trees work. They look at things from an architectural point of view. In the case of computer systems, uh, as much of a shock as it may come to people, our basic computer architecture hasn't changed in roughly, oh, what would it be, 60 years? Uh, you know, the cell phone in your pocket is pretty much the same computer architecture as an IBM 360 was back in the 1960s. And as a result, the, the strategies that are used for attacking systems haven't changed a lot. Uh, I teach a three-day course on attack tree analysis, and one of the challenges I often give the students is to let me know or tell me about any attacks that they think are really new and novel. And it's amazing how difficult it is to think of new and novel attacks that haven't been described in the academic literature uh, 20 or 30 or even further back. And, you know, um, although we deal with industrial control systems, um, and, and we think that they're special, and of course they are, they have certain characteristics that are different than a, an information technology system. Nonetheless, they are based on the same processor architectures, you know, the same memory structures uh, in many, many regards as the, uh, the, the PC that's sitting on your desk or the cell phone in your pocket. So as a result, um, the attack tree is able to describe these things in an architectural fashion what are the main steps that have to be taken in order to compromise the system? You haven't used the word, but I have the sense that, you know, hundreds of thousands of paths, I have the sense that what you're going for here is comprehensive. Um, now, and, and you've, you know, you've talked about, you know, the building analogy. I like the building analogy. Um, something I've argued in, in uh, you know, the, the books that I've written is that, uh, you know, tell me what you think of it, um, all cyber attacks are information every information flow into an industrial control system be it online like through a wire or offline you know a laptop being carried into the site all of those information flows are attack vectors um you know does that you know does that fit here is this is this in a sense part of the same picture you're absolutely correct uh, anytime you have an information flow, that is a potential attack vector. I mean, we look at the solar winds attack that occurred recently that everyone's in a you know flurry of activity about. And really, that was just a way in which someone managed to introduce harmful information, in this case, code, into the systems. Uh, basically, it was approved code. It was signed code. Everybody trusted it. So they happily carried it past all of their defenses, plugged it in, and installed it. So in that sense, yes, information is absolutely an attack vector. Is it the only attack vector? Um, perhaps not. The other ones are certainly less common. And I'm thinking of situations where someone might actually do an, an attack against the hardware itself. Uh, you know, for example, plugging probes in or, or connecting wires or doing things like this. Uh, that they might just be able to monitor things. So they might actually not be putting any information into it conceivably they're taking information out of it. So I suppose at some level information always involves it, but it may not be as obvious as, uh, as the situation you describe. Andrew, perhaps it's just because I've gotten so used to the way you talk about these things. Isn't every cyber attack just malicious information flowing into a system? In a sense, and, and you know, I found Terry's answer, you know, uh, insightful. Um, 
you know, my own writing, my own focus has been on preventing sabotage. But, you know, and, and you know, a lot of Terry's business is preventing sabotage. But, you know, he has, a, you know, in a sense, a, a broader business than I do. Um, a uh, Some of his business is preventing the theft of information. And he points out correctly that uh, in many cases, it's possible to just observe physical characteristics of, of a computing system, you know, uh, radiation, sound levels sometimes, and use what you observe to steal information from that computer system. I see, but still in my head, aren't you sending some kind of information into that system, even if your goal is to remove data? Well, you can. I mean, you can send queries into a system through a firewall or something, say, give me the data and get the data back. Um, but, you know, there's other ways to do it. So, you know, in Terry's example, maybe a more elaborate example, I remember, you know, back in my youth, I was I was developing control systems. Um, one of the, you know, our, our control system products was being used by the military for purposes unspecified. You know, they wouldn't tell us. It was classified. Fine. What they did tell us was that uh, at one point uh, they had, because they were using you know this for a, a sensitive purpose, they had to undergo a security assessment of the uh, the product. And I said, and you know, how did we fare? Because back then nobody designed control systems for security. I was curious, and they said, well, you know, it was a very interesting assessment. They they called, they booked the assessment on the day a you know an eighteen wheeler, a semi trailer pulled up. And parked outside the the front of the, you know the front of the building, they extracted a a thirty foot antenna and mounted it on top of the vehicle and pointed it at the office. They sat there for three days and they came back and said, um, "We are picking up all kinds of radio emissions from your system. That's the bad news. It's you know your your system is leaky as a sieve." The good news is there is so much noise there. There's so much energy coming off of that system. We cannot make head or tails out of you know the what what your system is doing by monitoring its electromagnetic radiation. Um, you know we cannot figure out what any of the, of the information is. You pass, and they said, "Thanks, I guess." <laughs> Um, so that's an example of extracting, you know, it's, it's one technique of extracting information from computers without touching them, without sending anything, and you just sit there and monitor what they are radiating. The other thing a lot of people have been talking about lately is the MITRE ATT&CK framework. The MITRE ATT&CK framework doesn't have, you know, does not have hundreds of thousands of, of, of attack paths documented. It has, I don't know, a thousand-ish steps in attacks. You know, how does the how does the framework and and you know, how do you compare frameworks and information flows to these attack paths? What what's in a sense what's why is there more attack paths than there are information flows or steps in a in a MITRE framework? Oh well, sure. And, and in fact, you know, the MITRE frameworks are actually in, in some cases uh, outlined as trees or attack trees if you will. Um, the MITRE frameworks there's two of them. There's attack and there's KPEC they tend to correspond to the lower levels in an attack tree. And that's because essentially of the, of the context in which MITRE is operating. Uh, MITRE is trying to show the different patterns, the different sequences of events or things that an attacker will do to carry out some particular activity or objective. What MITRE is not able to do, not because the folks at MITRE are not clever, they're ex extremely clever people, I've, I've interacted with them and they're as smart as you can find, but rather because they have to make those attack patterns uh, very general. They have to be useful for a very, very wide range of applications. I mean, somebody who's running an Oracle database and somebody who's running an industrial control system and somebody who's doing an information at, uh, or Internet of Things device. So necessarily, the attack patterns that they describe in their models or in their, their framework happen at the lower levels of the attack tree. In order to do uh, a buffer overflow attack, the attacker must do X, Y, and your choice of Z or Z. And, and that's how they arrive at, at that sort of goal or that state. Those states in and of themselves are not really an attack. They're part of an attack, but they're not an attack. What the higher levels of the attack tree do is they bring the context into the whole discussion. 
So for example, uh, a MITRE attack tree or a MITRE framework uh, might describe ways in which someone gets a toehold on a particular computer system. And that's very interesting, but in and of itself, it's not the attack. Suppose someone is trying to get onto an industrial control network where they can do bad things, uh, you know, control devices or maybe make the uh, operators go blind. Um, basically, that's going to involve several stages architecturally. They might start out on the internet and the first stage of attack will be to get a toehold on the DMZ uh, of that uh, particular organization where their web server or may maybe their mail server resides. And then from there, they're going to pivot and trying to get through the firewall, maybe by sending some, uh, some sort of a phishing attack or something, and trying to get somebody to click on a link. That will take them onto the business network. And then from there, they've got to go on and identify uh, which particular uh, devices on this business network are trusted enough to get to the DMZ leading onto the industrial control network. And, you know, they keep pivoting and moving stage by stage until they finally achieve their goal of getting onto that industrial control network. Now, you ask, why do the numbers become so explosively large? Well, think about it this way. If you have, let's just be really simple here. If you have 10 ways of breaking onto that initial internet DMZ, and then 10 ways of pivoting onto the business network, and then 10 ways of getting onto the industrial control system DMZ, and then 10 ways of compromising the host once you get to the uh, OT network. What is that? I, I lost count there, but it's like 10 to the fourth or something like that. Combinations of ways in which you could make it from the outside to the uh, soft, uh, chewy inside. And so the attack tree is, is capturing all that and is able to remember that and able to do analysis. And None of this would be feasible if we had to do it by hand. I mean, it'd be interesting, but it's kind of like, you know, spreadsheets. Spreadsheets have actually existed for several hundred years, but they only became practical when we applied computer technology to it to do the analysis. I mean, the recalcs are a real bear if you don't have a computer under you for, for uh, a spreadsheet. In similar fashion, a computer can deal with this large number of paths through the tree and analyze them and tell which paths are the ones that are feasible for the attacker that they're able to perform, which ones are desirable for the attacker, in other words, they achieve their goals, and the combination of being feasible and desirable gives you a measure of likelihood, or as we call it, propensity. And then when you take a look at uh, which paths are most likely, you have to examine which ones are going to be most harmful to the victim, to the target, and the combination of impact on the target and the likelihood of the attack gives you risk. So my next question was going to be, you know, hundreds of thousands of paths, how do you use them? But I think you're leading into that already with, you know, with your feasibility and, and desirability. Um, it, it sounds like you can score these paths and you can come back with, you know, in a sense, the, the paths that are the most attractive to the attacker. Is that how you use this? I mean, I can't imagine someone trying to wrap their head around 100,000 or a million attack paths. Does the score, is this how you use these things? Absolutely correct. And I'll even go a little further than that. Um, you made a very good point. You said, uh, I think you used somewhere in that question, the word attacker. And this comes really back to the question of, are you secure or said in another way, do you have an acceptable level of risk, which is the way I prefer to term it? And the answer to that question is, it depends. It depends a lot, well, obviously on your uh, security controls, uh, the architecture of the system and the, the controls and countermeasures that you put in place. But it also depends equally as much on the nature of your adversary. So, now that you've built this attack tree model, and this model basically shows um, how attackers could exploit the vulnerabilities in your system in various combinations that satisfy this and or logic and lead them to some high level goal that they want to achieve. But what it doesn't tell you is, will they use this path versus that path? 
And to answer that question, we need to bring a second model into this, and that is the model of the adversary. I tell people that if you're building a castle and you're trying to protect your castle, so you're going to build a wall around it, you know, the question might well be asked, how tall of a wall do we need? And the answer to that depends on whether or not your enemy is a giant, you know, 20 foot tall with, with uh, very long legs that can scale big walls, or you're dealing with, with you know, the, the seven dwarfs from, uh, from Snow White. Uh, basically, you need to have defenses that are sufficient to deter or prevent your adversary from achieving success. In other words, you have to make the resource costs, the costs that they're going to put forward in both financial terms, technical ability, time, that might be physical proximity, all of these types of resources that they apply, you're trying to make your defenses such that they are beyond that adversary's capability. So what we would normally do is we would create this attack tree model of the system you are trying to protect. And it would, uh, you know, we populate with all these values that would show uh, that this particular operation is very expensive, but can be done very quickly, not much technical ability. That operation over there, no, that one requires a moderate technical ability, and so forth. And then the software that you would use to analyze the attack tree will go through these 100,000 paths and basically build up uh, kind of a spreadsheet, if you will, a table. Uh, showing that for each attack scenario, each, each path through the tree, these would be the costs in various resources to the attacker. You then take that model that you're going to construct of your attacker. Is this attacker a script kitty? Are they a state-sponsored intelligence agency? Uh, are they a, a competitor who just wants to shut down your operation so that they can get some sort of competitive advantage in the marketplace? And you contrast those two models to see what your adversaries are capable of doing. So basically, you're looking to see what paths through the tree for a given adversary are both feasible and desirable. They have the capability of doing them, and the results will be something that is attractive to them. If an adversary possesses both of those properties, or a path through the tree lends itself to those properties, then the adversary can be said to be likely to perform that particular attack. And of course, there's other things that you can bring into it. Um, for starters, there's a lot of heuristics that can apply that help the computer to be able to crunch through this large amount of data. Um, and other things come into play, such as, for example, how big is the pool of adversaries? In some ways, script kiddies are more or as dangerous as state-sponsored intelligence agencies um, State-sponsored intelligence agencies, for example, are very reticent to be detected or at least attributed, whereas the states, uh, the script kitty uh, is usually bold, brash, and foolish and will do very, very risky things uh, that might get them detected. But most importantly, uh, you're probably only facing, you know, a handful of state-sponsored intelligence agencies, but you may be facing 100,000 script kitties out on the internet. So, all of these factors can be brought into these models and do fairly sophisticated analysis. What Terry's saying there makes a lot of sense and he's very articulate in explaining um, how these attack trees work. But my thought as he's describing it is um, not just what the attack tree is getting right, but what it might be missing. You know, it may just be that because he had mentioned solar winds um, just recently, it's in my head. But solar winds is one good example of an attack that I'm not sure even security experts would have predicted could have occurred with such efficiency so easily for the people who carried it out. Is it possible that by doing these attack trees, you know, we're identifying? 200 problems and missing 100 more and gaining confidence that, hey, we've covered up 200 holes, but wait, there are 100 more and we're, we're not even thinking about it. I think the short answer is yes, that's an issue. Um, Terry does talk about this later in the interview, so I won't I won't give too much away. But you know, I think the the short answer to your question is um, yeah, there's a lot of different kinds of ways to breach uh, a, 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 you know, an industrial control system or any other kind of computer system. And the attack tree methodology is very general. And so uh, part of what you have to be careful of is choosing 
where to apply it. And if you constrain yourself too narrowly, yeah, you miss stuff outside. So you've got to, you've got to pick your boundaries carefully. What confused me was that if you've got 100,000 attack paths, common wisdom is that if your adversary has enough time, money, and talent, they can get through anything, which suggests that, in a sense, there's an unlimited number of attack paths. Um, you know, but it sounds like the way you connect the two is with the adversary's model. If you have an adversary with you know, much larger uh, time, resources, and, and uh, talent, then they have a larger number of attacks available to them than mere mortals do. Is, is that how this fits together? That was a, a great comment. Uh, very few people recognize the issue of time in the attack space. Uh, you know, to answer your, your, the quick question is, yes, basically the attacker, the, the models of the attacker highlight the uh, attacks which they are most likely to perform, and then you identify the parts of the attack tree that they are traversing to do those attacks, and those become choke points. Like, yes, there are, I mean, almost infinite number of attacks on anything. I mean, uh, if you're going to pour things down the vent holes of a computer, uh, you know, what do you pour down? Water, ketchup, uh, you know, hot sauce. Uh, you could go on indefinitely. The architectural number of approaches are usually fairly limited in an attack. And basically, what we're looking for in our attack tree is mid-level nodes in that tree that a lot of different paths are passing through. And those become choke points that if we do something at those levels to make life really difficult for our attacker, we can, with one act, in many cases, block 10,000 or 20,000 attacks. I'll also mention that generally in an attack tree with, say, 100,000 what we call attack scenarios, when you do the analysis and say which ones are feasible, uh, just as a typical you know, kind of uh, rule of thumb, I would say that roughly 80% of the theoretically possible attacks are not achievable by any you know, plausible adversary. So you're immediately left down with like 20% that you can focus on. But I wanted to make a comment about time. And this is something I learned from the people in aerospace. Uh, aerospace people have been dealing uh, for many years with control systems and using attack trees to evaluate them. Now, the people who build these uh, are very concerned about the secrets in their control systems being divulged. Uh, there, in many cases, there are billions, quite literally billions of dollars of research that go into building these avionics devices. Uh, for example, the F-35 fighter plane uh, had a total cost of somewhere around $1 trillion, and a major part of that involved the computer technology on board with it. So they build this stuff called anti-tamper or tamper resistance into their control systems, which are a protection layer that if the, say, the aircraft should crash and a component fall into enemy hands, that it would be very, very difficult for the adversary to extract the information in it. Now, here's the interesting part that somebody in aerospace pointed out to me. They said, all of this stuff, as you point out, has a finite lifetime. When we build an avionics board, the contractor or the, the, the you know, prime contractor, I guess ultimately the government involved, gives them a specification and says, we expect this board to withstand attack for an specified time period, let's say seven years. What they're really saying is that the very first units of that board that come off the assembly line, we want you to mentally suppose that you hand them to our worst enemies, our worst enemies intelligence agencies. And we expect those boards to last and withstand electronic waterboarding until that specified time, say seven years. And at the five year mark, we're going to recognize that we, we are getting near the lifespan of that device and we better start engineering a new one so that at the seven year point, we declare the old one compromised, whether there's any evidence of it or not and we substitute in the new boards. The point I want to make there is exactly as you say, nothing will withstand an attack indefinitely. What we are trying to do, I think the goal is, is we are trying to make our systems resilient and robust enough to withstand attack within the system's lifespan. 
And that is a very important point when it comes to industrial control systems because, you know, historically these control systems have gone in and had very little changes in many cases for a decade or more. Uh, you know, that thinking I think was acceptable 20 years ago, but in the climate that we live now, I think that uh, certainly the security controls on an industrial control system are going to have to be updated and revamped on a more regular basis so that we can extend, we can maintain the risk at an acceptable level for the time period that we are concerned about. You know, you've been using attack trees, uh, you know, at Amanaza, you not you have not just an attack tree tool, but you, you provide a consulting service. You've been using this attack tree tool for some time. You talked about choke points. Um, you know, are there lessons you can you can give us about these about these choke points? You know, are there sort of a, a top twenty set of choke points that everybody should be aware of? How how do those choke points agree with you know, say the top twenty controls for for uh, industrial control systems or you know the, the other advice out there? You know, does it is there a strong agreement? Yes and no. Um, all of these things, you know, you see these best practices lists, top 20s, top 10, top whatever it is. And, and these are essentially checklist things. The concern I have with the checklist is not that they're not good. I mean, they involve great advice and so forth. But sometimes um, if you do all of the things on the checklist, you may be compliant, but you may not be secure. And that's because it just depends on where you're deploying these technologies. That's where you are actually uh, in the attack tree, where that particular control is fitting in. In some cases, you can deploy the control and it will have utterly no effect. I mean, you can check the box. Have we got one of those? Yes. I mean, I remember 25 years ago when people were just first getting connected to the internet, I was called in to do a security assessment at a company and, uh, you know, naively, I said to the guy, I said, uh, do you have a firewall? And he says, oh, yes. I said, well, that's great. Uh, he says, and he points up on the shelf above him. And he says, it's up there in that box. So I suppose that, you know, he checked the box that he had the firewall, but it wasn't actually out of the box or plugged in or doing anything. Well, in the same way that you can follow all of these best practices, and if you put things in the wrong place or where they don't matter, uh, you'll get no effect. On the other hand, if you do some of those best practices in the right place, in the right way, they will have a tremendous effect on the adversary. Let me kind of explain more about a choke point. Basically, in these attack tree models, there's, there's three kind of nodes. There's leaf nodes way down at the bottom of the tree, and they represent the activities, the actual activities the attacker is doing. You know, they're jimmying a door, they're guessing a password, they're sending a packet, whatever it is that they're doing, that's all leaf level stuff. Above them in the attack tree or above those points are AND and OR nodes. OR nodes show different ways of getting to that particular OR state. That OR state might be take control of a computer on the business network. Uh, there's also AND nodes. AND nodes are basically describing processes or procedures, sequences of operations that must be performed in order for the AND node to be achieved. AND nodes are the key in an attack tree when it comes to defenses because they involve usually multiple things that the attacker must do to get to that AND node state. And if they're going to get past that AND node, they need to perform all of those. Well, some of those states or some of those actions that lead to that AND node they're just simply too easy. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of handed to us. Oftentimes we don't get to choose them because, well, we didn't build the system from scratch. We didn't design it. Uh, so we're being handed this AND node which, with a bunch of operations underneath it, which are fairly easy. At this point, what you do though, is you say, well, I, maybe I can't do anything about that stuff I've been handed. But what I can do is go to my list of 20 best practices and look at some technology or something or some uh, process or protocol that I can introduce at this end level and make it an extra operation that the attacker has to do or maybe an extra two or three operations the attacker has to do. And I'm going to choose them so that they are known to be very difficult for the adversary I face. 
what that means is that that adversary, you know, they might be able to do uh, the operations one, two, three, and four under that AND node. Those were the easy ones. But now to get past that AND node or even to attain it, they have to do operations five and six, which you, the security professional, have implemented based on the knowledge of what your adversary can and can't do. And that basically blocks them at that point and they can't get past it. What Terry's talking about there is a little bit abstract for me, Andrew. Um, you got any like more concrete examples? Sure. Um, you know, he's talking about about and nodes where you have to do a sequence of steps, all of them. You know, A and B and C, all, all of them you have to do. Um, versus or nodes where you can get through something by doing X or Y, or you know, you've got your choice of attack methods. He says your and nodes tend to be the the most profitable choke points if you can find a way to make one of the steps in a, you know, I need to get three things done. If I can make one of the steps harder or if I can add a harder step, you know, I'm, I'm making the attack much harder. Classic example is, um, let's say, password guessing. You know, if I have a, uh, a host I want to log into remotely, um, how do I do it? Well, uh, I can, you know, uh, send a phishing attack uh, and, you know, trick someone into stealing the password or uh, pick up the phone and trick someone into divulging the password. And then I have to somehow connect to the machine that I'm targeting. And, uh, you know, if I'm, let's say, I already have uh, a presence, I already have a, a compromised machine on the IT network, I can probably connect to any machine on the IT network. So I do that. That's straightforward. And then I have to use the stolen password to log into the machine again straightforward. These are sort of three straightforward steps. If I can somehow make one of these steps harder, um, I can make the attack harder. Or his example was I can add steps, you know, five or six. So the classic step that people add is two-factor authentication. Uh, now, you know, it's not enough to steal the password and gain access to the machine and log in. I also have to you know, do the two-factor thing. I've got to find out how to, to deceive the two-factor thing. I have to break a key or I have to, you know, physically steal a, a, a key fob, um, you know, all of which can be much harder than just sending an email and, and stealing the password. And I agree with you, although aren't there plenty of examples of attackers, say, um, breaching SMS two-factor authentication such that maybe um, your example can just, you know, introduce new kinds of attack paths rather than eliminate them entirely? I think the, the short answer is yes. Every time you change the system, I've changed it, you know, in my example, by adding the two-factor authentication. Every time you change the system, you change the attack tree. And now you have new nodes open saying, well, how would I breach the two-factor authentication? And uh, I think, you know, the, the, the easy answer is that it depends on the attacker. Um, if the attacker is physically there, they might have an opportunity to physically steal a, a key fob. If the attacker is on the other side of the planet, you know, it's going to be hard to steal the key fob. What are, what are their options then? It might be, you know, if instead of a key fob, I've said I'm using, um, you know, the, the uh, SMS text message as my, my two-factor authentication, and I'm nearby, I might be able to tap into that and, you know, fake that out as well. So um, every time you introduce a new defense, you introduce new branches in the attack tree. But again, it's a question of difficulty. If I've added an and, you know, and I need to break the two-factor, and it turns out breaking the two-factor really is difficult for the adversary I'm modeling, well, then I've materially improved the security of my system. The people that I talk to, there's a lot of interest in targeted ransomware. Um, you know, I, uh, I went and, and surveyed the news reports. There was less than a dozen uh, incidents. There was, I found 10 in 2020 that shut down physical operations. And all 10 were targeted ransomware. Targeted ransomware seems to have arrived as the, you know, the thing that's causing physical shutdowns in, in industrial control systems. And the problem with targeted ransomware is that it's targeted. You know, these people operate these attacks by remote control. And, you know, they're actually very sophisticated. They're using the attack techniques and the attack technologies that nation states were using five years ago. These, you know, the, the organized crime has, has caught up to what, you know, nation states were doing only a couple of years ago. Um, 
if this is the new pervasive threat, um, you know, is there a lot of point in looking at at, uh, at at script kiddies? Should we not sort of focus on on you know characterizing the pervasive threat? Can can you talk about these adversaries? Interesting that you should uh, point out how capabilities of adversaries evolve with time. You know, again, I look back and, and this, I guess, proves how old I am. But the first time I ever saw a network packet sniffer, uh, gosh, that was be back in about 1995. And the gadget we were so impressed with it, it cost $50,000. And we were just astonished the fact that you could plug it in and actually see packets flowing by on a network and it would decode them and tell you that, you know, this is a TCP IP uh, packet, this is a DNS request, this is whatever it was. Of course, that same capability and probably considerably more is available for free download off the internet today. So, you know, that which was a $50,000 cost uh, to do uh, back in 1995 as essentially zero cost a day and accessible by every script kitty. And, you know, this brings up an excellent question that I, I think that everyone out there who is operating an industrial control system, uh, particularly in critical infrastructure, should be asking themselves. Has your management or the government or anybody ever told you what level of adversary you are expected to, uh, to withstand. Because unless you know what the expectation is, you cannot say that you are secure. Because secure to what? And if you overguess, you know, you say, I think I better handle state sponsored, you can do that, but it's going to be very costly in terms of what you have to uh, do. And your management may not be happy with you. On the other hand, if you underguess, and something bad happens, people are going to come to you and say, well, you told us you were secure, and I assumed that you would be able to withstand this level of attack. So that is a question I would encourage all of the operators of uh, ICS to go back and ask their management quite explicitly. Make them give you an answer. Waterfall Security Solutions is the OT security company. In our latest report, we look back at 2020. We observed that the most important threats in 2020 were targeted ransomware, supply chain breaches, and cloud connectivity. We pull these threats together into four new kinds of blended attacks. Then we look at different kinds of cyber defenses, and we determine how effective these defenses are against each of these modern attacks. To access these insights into today's threats and what can be done about them, please download our report at waterfall-security.com slash 2020 report. The sentiment that Terry just ended with there is something I hear from you a lot. It is. And, you know, he used different words, um, but I agree with him completely. I, you know, I thought what he's saying there is, is right on the money. Um, you know, what, what I've pointed out, you know, sort of, to security beginners is the first law of, of you know, SCADA security is that nothing is secure. The question, are we secure, is meaningless. Security is not a yes or no thing. Security is a spectrum. We can always be more secure. We can always be less secure. The question, how secure are we, has an answer. The question, how, sh how secure should we be, is even more important. And you know, the real question is, we can ask the question, how, how secure should we be? How do we answer that? How do you measure security? And, you know, Terry, I think, has hit the nail on the head here. He says, you measure security scientifically in terms of the most capable adversary that you are able to defeat reasonably reliably. And you have to define what reliably means. You define, uh, you know, how secure we are in terms of the most capable attack or the most capable adversary. You know, you can also define it in terms of the most capable attack that we we, we defeat reliably. Um, and so, you know, most security programs don't start with a goal like this, and so they never know if they've arrived. You know, you put one of each security thing in place and cross your fingers that you're more secure than you used to be. But you know, depending on where you put these things you might not be. So I think it's very important, you know, the, the, the point that Terry just made, which is define your adversary, the most capable adversary that, that, uh, that you're going to defeat. That's a great way to uh, define a goal for your security program. 
So this is very interesting. But, you know, in a sense, we've been talking about attack trees in the abstract. We've been talking about, you know, your experience in the marketplace. But, um, you know, this is not abstract. Um, you folks at Amanaza have technology, you provide services. Can you talk to me, you know, just a little deeper? What, what do you have? What do you do? Amanaza, first and foremost, is a, a tool vendor. We produce or create a very sophisticated attack tree threat modeling tool called Secure Tree. Um, I believe that Secure Tree is probably the leading tool that is commercially available and possibly even if the best tool that's available uh, even in classified environments based on the kind of customers we have uh, for building and analyzing attack trees. Uh, our software has now been under development for actually over 20 years. It is very sophisticated. Um, because of that sophistication, it can be quite intimidating for people, uh, you know, who's first starting out. Like, you know, they double click on the uh, secure tree icon, it launches in its glory, and then the question is, and now what? Uh, because of that question, we actually offer and provide a three-day training course in attack tree analysis uh, using Securitry. So we sit down with people uh, generally, well, uh, in other than pandemic times, we are at their sites and we actually uh, teach their people and show them how to construct an attack tree, how to construct models of their adversaries, how to do the analysis, and how to use the information coming out of that analysis to plan out effective and cost-effective controls and countermeasures. We do do some consulting work, uh, certainly have done, have been involved in consulting activities. Uh, one that I did uh, not so long ago involved an industrial control system at an energy company. Uh, they had a plant that they were concerned about the security of it. Uh, basically, this plant was of a nature that if things went badly wrong, you would have a lo loud kaboom and perhaps a crater in the ground. And they wanted to know if their controls were uh, sufficient and effective. Well, we did the analysis and it is uh, quite interesting, the response we got. First of all, the analysis showed that they were, I think, exceptional. I think they were above average in what they had done in securing their systems. Uh, they were a very competent group, and I, I don't take that away from them in any way. What we did discover is that their system was probably uh, able to withstand attacks from uh, kind of the organized crime level of uh, attacker. Uh, people with professional qualifications, but not with access to state-sponsored laboratories or, you know, PhDs, that kind of thing. And so that became a question for them. Uh, were they prepared or should they be prepared to deal with state sponsored and i think that that question caused considerable angst in the organization and that it's a question that management typically doesn't like to answer uh, management wants to believe that the government is responsible for state sponsored but i don't know if the government has ever actually said that guys you're only on the hook up to or organized crime uh, we'll take it from there and that ambiguity is, I think, in some cases, useful <laughs> um, for organizations that are trying to balance the cost of their security against what they're responsible for. So um, as to how the, the report was received, it was quite interesting. Uh, some of the people were very, very receptive to it and found the results very interesting. Others, because they didn't want to know the answers they basically rejected it and found uh, or sought for any detail or, or you know, minuscule uh, detail in the model that they could point to that wasn't per perfectly accurate so that they could discount it. And I guess that's the thing I would tell you with attack trees is if you're going to do this type of analysis and you're going to ask these questions, you better be prepared for the answers. My dad does the same thing. He never goes to the doctor because he doesn't want to hear bad news about his cholesterol. Yeah, it's uh, it's tricky. Um, you know, Terry said uh, energy sector. He didn't say, you know, what geography. He did not say NERC SIP. I know from my own experience, uh, this is something that, you know, comes up from time to time in the, the North American energy sector. Um, a lot of the, the sector is say, you know, let's use the word consumed with compliance with NERCSIP. Uh, 
you know, the, the, the standard demands a culture of compliance. There's a lot of focus on compliance. There's a lot of money and effort and, you know, personal reputation, uh, and, you know, invested in compliance, following all of the rules absolutely perfectly. Um, NERC SIP does not offer any guarantees as to how secure you are made by following all of the rules. And, you know, a lot of businesses simply don't ask the question, how secure am I if I follow all of these rules? They assume that following all the rules is what you need to do. End of story. And when they discover that, well, if you follow all of the rules, you're only so secure. And there are still adversaries out there that, you know, credible adversaries that, that could come after you given a sufficient investment in the attack. And if you've never asked this question, if you're so consumed with, with compliance, you know, this may come as a very rude surprise. Uh, again, I think it comes back to, to Terry's point. Part of the design of the security system has to be more than follow the rules. It has to be asking the question, how capable an adversary do we need to repel? And what would it cost to repel them, you know, there's there's cost benefit decisions that have to be made in that in that calculus, and a lot of people just haven't asked the question. And when they have sort of the answer shown in their face, they can become very defensive of the reputation and the investment they've made in following the rules. So we've been talking about uh, doing the the analysis. How do people use the results? I mean, you know. Business decision makers traditionally have a hard time understanding the results of, you know, complex risk assessments. How do people use your uh, the, the results of your analysis? You know, most of the analysis people do, risk analysis, risk assessments, tend to be kind of a qualitative sort of thing. What we are trying to do, what our goal is, is to make this as objective, as rigorous, and as quantitative as possible. So how do you how do you depict an attack in a way that people can have a confidence in that, you know, this attack, we think the probability is high versus this one over here that we think the probability is low. You know, why would they have any confidence in the numbers we're coming up with? Well, it boils down to the fact that we're showing that, yes, these particular attacks here are all well within the attacker's capability. I mean, this is something, you know, you show on, on, on some type of a scale. Look, the amount of money they'd have to spend to do the attack is, is well within this type of attacker's budget. The amount of, amount of time it would take is, again, well within their budget. And, and you show for each of these resources that these attacks are going to be very, very feasible, that there's just no question about it. And if you then say, and by the way, and look how well they satisfy the attacker's goals. Uh, you pointed to the uh, targeted ransomware attacks previously. Well, I mean, it's very obvious. The attackers after money. They want to extort money. And will this attack achieve this? Absolutely it will. Can they do it? Apparently so. It's very, very easy. We see examples of it. So you can show that. Whereas the other less likely attacks or less feasible attacks and ones that provide less benefit to the attacker, uh, the only time you'd really look at those is if they have a very high impact on the target. And this gets into uh, the area of what I call um, the different quadrants of risk. If you mentally take the two parameters in a risk equation, which is uh, probability and impact, and put them on a, a graph or a quadrant system, you get four quadrants. And you know the quadrant where people are most familiar with is the quadrant where stuff is happening all the time, but the impact is fairly moderate. You don't need fancy analysis to deal with this. If you know that you're picking up a virus you know, every week or somebody's clicking on some sort of a phishing email, you don't need uh, three weeks of analysis to point out that that's your problem. Generally speaking, the things that happen every week in every large organization are not fatal. Uh, there's enough controls in place to, to deal with them. If there's not enough controls, you quickly learn and put controls there and you're, you're fine. The area that's most difficult to deal with, and the one that is so so thorny for management, is the quadrant where things don't happen very often, but if they did, they would be devastating. And the problem with this quadrant, it is the largely the, the quadrant of the hypothetical. The quadrant of the things that could happen, many of which have never happened before. 
And there's so many things, so many hypothetical things in that quadrant that no one would have the resources to deal with all of them. What we try to do is say of those thousands of things that lie in that quadrant, the, this is the Martians landing on, on you know, Government Hill um, and carrying out some sort of attack. Is it conceivable? Is it hypothetical? Yes. Is it going to happen? No. We want to separate those events from those that just haven't happened yet and highlight those and allow people to prepare for the things that haven't happened yet but are at least plausible and when they happen they will be the things that that you know are extremely serious they could threaten the life of the organization so you know our whole plan here our whole process tries to take the numbers that we do understand what resources would be required to do this operation for instance and translate that into a form that essentially expresses whether or not an attack is possible and whether it's probable can we speak to current events you know the big news is solar winds um does this factor in your threat models oh yes this is an excellent example of where most of the tools most of the technologies out there you know trying to protect organizations just can't cope with it it's because they're not designed for it you know if you think about it virtually all of the tools and technologies that are available today deal with one of two things the past or the present the past in the sense that they look at logs they look at forensics that kind of stuff the present in that de they deal with what is happening on your network at this very moment attack trees are one of the few mechanisms that allow you to deal with the future and until we start dealing with the future we are always going to be in reactive mode many of the attack trees i've built have had as a branch one of the attack vectors, a supply chain type attack, which Solar Winds was. Now, um, in fairness, I haven't populated that because, well, the people I've been working with <clears throat> didn't really want us to go down there, but the attack tree definitely pointed out that it was an area of concern that attacks could come via uh, a supply chain attack. <clears throat> now, when you talk about a supply chain attack, I'll tell you that there's really two situations you want to deal with or have to consider. Uh, the first is where your supplier is hostile, that you don't trust them. Well, oddly enough, that's a, at least conceptually a fairly easy situation to deal with. You either get yourself a new supplier or you architect your system in such a way that it doesn't matter whether or not their software or product is hostile or not. Now, that's easier said than done, but at least conceptually, it's simple. The other situation is where the supplier um, is absolutely you know, good-natured, they're, they're doing their best, but their security may allow a compromise, which is kind of, I think, what happened with solar winds. It was no malice on the part of the people who created solar winds, just that their security was inadequate in preventing an attack that uh, infected their software with malware. And, you know, that's a much more difficult uh, situation to deal with, but it's one that you can model in an attack tree. You can model what happens if this component of my system has actually changed sides. It's working against me. And you can show whether or not your controls might be effective, even if that were hostile. As an example, um, suppose somebody had had the foresight to say, you know what, I... I I'm not sure about this software that I'm loading. It comes from the vendor, and gee, they're great guys, but, but I just don't know what their security's like. Um, you know, one option is obviously to go and try and get into their security, you know, have, have reviews with them, insist them to tell you all the details. No vendor's going to do that, by the way, and you wouldn't have time to do it with all your vendors, even if they did. But the other option might have been to say, you know what, for if this software is hostile, if it has been compromised, it's going to need a control channel and it's going to have to be able to pass information in and out to do its dastardly deeds what i could do is go out and get a unidirectional gateway i don't know if you know any suppliers of that technology and use that as my bridge and make sure that 
even if they can get this software installed, they won't be able to build that command control channel and, and their software will fail in its activities. Now, that won't protect you against everything. For example, if you have state sponsor that is building autonomously controlled uh, malware, malware that is so smart that it can operate without the command and control channel, then you're still vulnerable to that. But hopefully the analysis would show that would be above the level of your adversary and so you could safely accept that risk. You know, Andrew, I could talk about unidirectional gateways all day, but how does uh, what you guys were just talking about there, how does a unidirectional gateway have anything to do with identifying the major problem of SolarWinds, which was these malicious software updates? Let me give you a couple of answers. Um, you know, one is the, the attack tree model identifies the potential for a solar winds type attack. Uh, you know, supply chain attacks are not new. They, they haven't had that much press in the industrial security world, but there have been a fair number of them in the last, you know, half decade in the, in the IT space. And so, you know, Terry's point was that, you know, his tool, of course, includes this as a potential attack vector. Uh, to your question about the unidirectional gateways, you know, Terry was giving a, a, a scenario where the gateways would serve as a mechanism for preventing the damage due to this kind of attack. And there's really two pieces to the attack. Uh, SolarWinds, if you recall, embedded malware in a secure, uh, sorry, in a, in a software update. I think it was a security update. And so um, the you know, there, it's not that the unidirectional gateway would have prevented the security update from being installed because the malware was remote control malware. It installed itself. It tried to connect to a command and control server on the internet and it waited for instructions. If no connection was possible because there's a gateway in the way, well, the malware just sat there. You eventually have to clean it out, but there's no damage done other than, you know, polluting the machine that it was it was in, uh, installed on. So, um, you know, I think the, the, the point was twofold, that supply chain attacks were in the model from the beginning. You know, this was no surprise to anyone who uses attack trees, this class of attack. Um, and the, the defense was talking about controlling the consequences rather than preventing the initial infection. Well, this has been great, Terry. Uh, you know, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you know, before we let you go, is there a thought you'd like to leave with our listeners? Yes, I think there is. What I want to point out is that the security profession in which we work seems to operate differently uh, than almost any other, you know, science or, or technology-based profession. Anybody else, when they go to build something, they have a, a set of requirements in their minds that they're trying to achieve doesn't matter if it's a computer network or even, say, a bridge. Look at how an engineer builds a bridge. They collect the requirements for the bridge. How long is it going to be? How, how, how tall is it going to be? What load is it expected to carry? They go off and do some design work. They do mathematical analysis to make sure that bridge is going to withstand the particular load. And then they, only at that point, do they order the stuff that they need to build the bridge. They assemble it. They, they verify that it was assembled in accordance with the design, and then the bridge is opened, and they know that it's safe for the load that it was designed for. In our context, the load our systems have to withstand is the type of attacker that we are repelling. So I would suggest that when we are designing a security system, no matter what process you're using, we'd better understand what the load is going to be. What is this system expected to withstand? And we better be able to give assurances that it will do so. Now, you know, as a parting thought, if, if any of this has been interesting to uh, the audience out there and they think, gee, I'd like to learn a little bit more about that, I'd certainly encourage them to drop by the Amanaza website, uh, www.amanaza.com. That's think of amen with AZA on the end.com. Uh, there's a white paper there uh, on attack tree analysis. And in fact, there's going to be a revised and greatly enhanced version of that white paper available about the same time this podcast uh, airs. So I would certainly encourage people to drop by, pick up the white paper. And if they have any questions, don't hesitate to give me a shout either on the phone or via email, uh, terry.inglesby at amanasa.com. And I look forward to hearing from them. 
So you guys got through a lot in that interview. Andrew, can you leave us with something to wrap things up here? Sure. I mean, I just want to echo what what Terry said. Um, you know, when I learned a lot in this interview, and and I especially like his his last insight there. I'm I'm going to say something similar to what I said when I read the uh, Secure PHA Review book. Um, when you hear someone like Terry speak, when you read the the Secure PHA Review book, when you when you learn something, um, you look back after having learned it. You look back and say. Everything you just told me is obvious. It's obviously true. Um, but you didn't know it until you learned it. That's the best kind of learning. It's, of course. And to me, what Terry's just said is, is one of those aha moments. You know, I didn't know it until he said it. But he said, look, you know, it's not engineering until we can specify the requirements. What's the goal? You've got to be able to specify the goal. And the goal had better be, you know, measurable, had better be, in a sense, scientific. It, ideally, it's numeric. Um, you know, if we want uh, the engineering, the, 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 the science of security to, to move forward, we've got to be able to specify the goal for how secure we have to be. We've got to be able to measure whether we've achieved that goal. And we've got to be able to measure the, you know, eventual deterioration of the artifact that we set in place as the attack environment changes to the point where we no longer meet the goal and we have to upgrade our systems because you know we've measured that that uh, the the you know where we are has moved this is all you know to me this is this is all obvious in hindsight but i didn't know it un, un, until i heard it so you know good job terry okay uh thanks to terry inglesby for speaking with you andrew And thank you, Andrew, as always, for speaking with me. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Nate. This has been the Industrial Security Podcast from Waterfall. Thanks to everyone listening. 